Thanks very much. Well, I'm very happy to see you all here. Thank you so much for taking the time to come and listen. And um, as Nick just said, this is the title of my PhD thesis, which is the occupation for the few years, hopefully. So my title is Colliery for Predator Trophodynamics in Response to Reef Condition. And I'll run you through a quick outline of what I'll be covering during the talk. So first of all, uh, we'll do an, an introduction to what are the major drivers um, in coral reef systems and what are the patterns of degradation and disturbance that are happening in response. Then look at the implications of these, this habitat degradation for fish, and then look at how these predators fit into this picture. Next, I'll give you my specific aims and research questions and then take you through a more detailed explanation of the various chapters that relate to those questions and the methods I'll be using. And finally, a bit about the progress that I've made so far and some of the background to what my projected timeline and budget are. So, as we're all acutely aware, coral reefs are facing drivers of change on a broad scale and these are driving patterns of disturbance and degradation uh, throughout the world. And uh, some of the, the key ones here are things like nutrient runoff, as a result of pollution and sedimentation from land-based sources, fishing, both subsistence and commercial, and increasing levels of anthropogenic CO2 in the atmosphere is driving climate change. So a few weeks ago at the Center Symposium, these three were identified as the key three drivers in habitat disturbance in coral reefs, but they're by no means the only ones either. So things like predator outbreaks are also causing large-scale disturbance, such as crown of thorns, which we're currently seeing again on the GBR, Disease is also a very important driver in many parts of the world, including the Caribbean. And increasingly frequent and intense uh, weather, dis weather disturbance is also occurring, such as storms. And individually and synergistically, these various drivers of change are resulting in widespread patterns of disturbance and habitat degradation on reefs. And when we think about what the implications of this might be for the associated fish communities on reef, it's useful to start, to start first thinking about what the impacts are on the habitat. So, these various disturbances are likely to have different, to affect various factors on the benthic habitat that may be important for fish. So for example, some disturbances may result in only a loss of live coral tissue while the structure of the reef is actually still maintained. So this would be as a result of something like chromosome starfish or bleaching, at least in the short term. Then you may get more extreme disturbance which is resulting in physical structural loss. So this may occur due to something like storm damage or to destructive fishing practices such as dynamite. Another pattern that we're seeing is that with these, these ongoing disturbances, we're actually seeing a changing, sh a shift in the coral assemblages on reefs. And this may be driven by a couple of things, including the differential vulnerability of various coral taxa to these different drivers. And this may be due to something like a varying thermal tolerance of the different taxa. So some may be more susceptible to bleaching um, while others would be much more tolerant. And then carnivore starfish have also been shown to have particular preferences for certain coral taxa. So they may therefore target certain taxa and leave others be. Also differential recovery rates after these disturbance impacts are likely to result in changing assemblages. And this could be associated with things like broodstock availability, larval connectivity, different growth rates, and different competitive um, ability of different coral taxa. So, in thinking about what's, what's going to be happening to, to fish due to habitat degradation, we've had a look at what the benthic responses are likely to be. The next step is to have a look at what the fish response is likely to be. And this is relying to a large extent on what the vulnerability is of certain groups within the fish community. And this vulnerability is likely to be dictated by things like the specific life history strategy of different species, but also by the degree of specialization and the, the closest of their interaction with certain components in the habitat. So for example, highly specialized species like coral feeding fish or coral dwellers will be very immediately impacted by a loss of live coral tissue. Similarly, many fish species also have um, a strong reliance on live coral tissue for their settlement use. So their recruitment may be quite dramatically impacted by loss of live tissue. Then as we start seeing a change in the structure of, reef, of the reef and changing assemblages, we may also see more community level impacts such as changes in predation dynamics as prey have limited refuge available, and also increasingly intensive competition, both intraspecific and extraspecific, as niche space availability decreases. So these all seem like fairly negative impacts, but they may actually be positive impacts as well. So very often associated with the decline in coral cover, we see an increase in algal cover. So your herbivores may be potentially advantaged, at least in the short term. 
So you can see that there's a, a, a wide variety of ways in which the, the fish community may respond to habitat degradation. And numerous studies have focused on different aspects of this. And these are brought together in various reviews, including this one by Wilson et al. in 2006. And you can see that on the x-axis here, they've, they've separated the fish community into various functional groups. And then on the y-axis, we have the change in fish abundance in relation to the change in coral cover. And then looking at both live coral tissue loss and physical structure loss, you can see the highly specialized species like the coronavirus and coral herders are being dramatically impacted by both disturbance types, whereas planktivorous species and invertebrates do not respond too badly to live coral loss, but as soon as the structure is lost, they too become impacted. And then when you get onto the more herbivorous species at this end, you can see that even a physical structure loss is not that detrimental to them on the scale of these studies. So what really strikes me from this image, though, is the fact that the predators are not included in this. There is no evidence of these predators or larger predatory fish. And this, this seems to indicate that at the time that this paper was done, there were insufficient studies to actually include them in this review. So this was in 2006, and since then there has been more recent research. And two of them that I pulled out is the findings of Graham in 2007. And they found that in response to habitat degradation, reduced prey availability for medium-sized piscivores could cause indirect decline in their numbers. Also, Wilson et al. in 2008 found that prey availability controlled by habitat complexity seems to be a more important driver of total piscivore abundance than fishing pressure. So these, um, as well as a number of others, highlight the near research gap. And this is that few studies have empirically assessed the fish community mediated effects of habitat condition on reef associated predators. And this is what I'd like to address through the research in my thesis. So to do this, um, I'll be focusing on meter predators, which I define here as medium to large body piscivorous fishes that are resident on the reef. So something like members of the family Serenity or the Chanidae. And why meter predators? Well, they, the fact that they're resident on the reef um, is quite important. So unlike larger predators that are actually traveling before, between reefs and have a far more pelagic lifestyle. And being resident on the reef, they're directly linked to the fish community of the reef and to the energy channels within the reef system. They're also widely considered to play a strong role in the ecology of reef systems and considered to be top-down drivers. They also have great economic value, both in subsistence and commercial fisheries, and in terms of a very lucrative fishing industry and tourism. And um, also in many parts of the world, they have great social value in various um, communities and societies. So in summary, we are well aware of all the drivers that are impacting on coral reefs currently, and there's been a great amount of focus on the, disturb on the disturbance and degradation patterns resulting from these. And a number of studies have looked at how this disturbance and degradation is going to be impacting on the benefit composition of reefs. And there's also been focus on how this benefit composition change and these, this habitat degradation will impact on the low trophic level fish community. But as yet, there seems to be very little information on what this holds for meter predators. How is habitat degradation affecting um, the meter predator group? And being fairly large and mobile species compared to many others on the reef, they're unlikely to be strongly directly impacted by their pickup changes on the reef, but changes in their crayfish community is likely to be the channel through which they are most immediately impacted, and this is the research gap that I'd like to assess during my PhD. This brings me to my aims and research questions for the thesis, and I aim to look at two, two key aims, and the first is to understand how changes in prey availability due to coral reef degradation affect the condition and diet of the skivorous reef meter predators. The second aim is to investigate how changes in the coral habitat affect the trophic structure of reef fish communities and what the implications are of this for the reef visa predators. So to do this, um, I've outlined four key research questions, each of which relates to one of my chapters. The first of these is, what are the effects of prey availability on visa predator condition, growth, growth rate, and fecundity? The second is, do visa predators switch their diet in response to changing prey availability due to reef degradation. Thirdly, how does trophic structure change with reef condition and what are the implications for the trophic role of these predators? <coughs> and lastly, how do you predict changes in coral assemblages moderate predator prey dynamics? So the first chapter will address this, this initial question of what are the effects of prey availability of changing prey availability on mesopredator condition, growth rates and fecundity. 
And this is a key question to me because uh, being fairly long lived species, many of these predators are unlikely to show immediate impacts of habitat degradation in their abundance in communities. But in, it, this doesn't mean that they're not having strong sublethal effects due to the due to the habitat degradation. And these may in the long term impact quite substantially on the abundance and community structure. So to look at this issue, uh, this, the study site that I'll be using is in the Seychelles, this is the inner island group. It's an island nation just to the northeast of Madagascar. And uh, on two islands there, so Mahe and Pradhan, there are 21 sites that have been the subject of a long-term monitoring project since 1994. And on each of these sites, the benthic composition and structure and fish community have been monitored, monitored up until present day. And the value of this monitoring system is that it, because it started in 1994, it's covered the period prior to and following the 1998 mass leaching event, which had particularly strong effects in the West Indian Ocean. So it's documented the initial state of the reefs and in addition, the trajectories of recovery and decline on the reefs following the leaching. So within these 21 sites, uh, it's been found that 12 of the sites are showing very strong signs of recovery. So following the initial drop in, in light coral cover in 1998, you can see that there's been a steady return of hard coral cover to these reefs. And macroalgae has never become a major feature in the benthic composition. However, in contrast, there are nine other reefs that have been monitored in the same area. And following the initial decline in hard coral cover during the beaching event, the hard coral has just has not managed to return to these reefs, and it's been a, a strong a strong proliferation of macroalgae on the sites that has held the, the hard coral back. So you can see that this is, is potentially an, an ideal place to have a look at what are the impacts of habitat degradation on reef needs of predators. So the field work for this, this chapter will be carried out in April next year, and the study species that I've chosen is Cephalophagus argus, and the reason for this is that it's 95% viscivorous, which means that it's very directly uh, dependent on the reef fish community on the reefs. It is also locally abundant in the wide spread, as we've seen from the long-term monitoring data, which means it can be sampled across all sites, and hopefully this will not have a substantial impact on the local abundance. And then also, it's an important local fishery species, so therefore a great relevance to local management. The design of the study will entail five recovering and five degrading sites, and at each of these, fish will be collected using a spear gun, and I aim to collect 10 to 20 adults of um, adult fish of the species at each site. With all the individuals collected, I plan to look at a number of sub evidence for a number of sublethal effects in the fish using different indices. The first is to look at the condition of the fish. Um, so broadly, I'll have a look at this initially with an overall condition factor to have a look at the general robust robustness of the fish, and then secondly look more closely at what the, the energy store is in the individuals by having a look at the parasite vacuole density in their livers. The second in this is, is growth. So I'd like to compare the different growth rates between the two habitat conditions by extracting the sexual otoliths and then analyzing the annuli to estimate their age and also relative growth rates. And this information can be used to see if there are any differences in the age relationships between the two habitat trajectories. And then finally, I'd like to look at fecundity. So by using the gonadosomatic index, the GSI, I'd like to assess the reproductive potential in, in fish from the two different reef, reef conditions. And because of the fact that, re, that reproductive potential may change on a daily or monthly or an annual cycle, we're going to incorporate a paired design into the sampling strategy for this project. So this will mean that on each day, we'll sample both a recovering and a degrading reef so that we can explicitly account for this in the data. Then all these condition factors will be analyzed using a hierarchical linear model. And in this, we can compare the pairs of sites and then the two different reef conditions and see if there are differences in these indices between fish on degraded habitats and recovering habitats. This brings me to the second chapter. So my second question is, do mesopredators switch their diet in response to changing prey availability due to reef degradation? And the importance of this to me is that if if reef or if prey communities are changing on coral reefs due to habitat degradation and resource predators have sufficient plasticity in their in their diet, then they'll be able to shift their diet to be able to take advantage of this changing resource base and thereby potentially ameliorate the sublethal effects that we're seeing that we're looking for in the first chapter. 
So the field work for this chapter was carried out in the Kipple Islands, which is on the southern GBR, just off Rockhampton. And this site too has been the subject of, of a long-term monitoring program. Many of you may recognize this, this figure. Um, <coughs> and you can also see from this figure over here that there's a huge amount of, of runoff in this region. So you're getting these periodic flood plumes that are having a, a fairly strong impact on, on the reefs around the capitals. But what has also been seen in the long-term monitoring is that, interestingly, the, the impacts of these sediment plumes are not uniform across the reefs. There are some that are having been far more heavily impacted than others. So in this, this graph, you can see just on a couple of the reefs that with percentage live coral cover on the, the y-axis here, that on some reefs, such as Plan Bay and Monkey Bay, between prior to the, the last great, the last big flood plume, which was in 2010, and following it, there was a relatively small difference in the coral cover on these reefs. Whereas other reefs showed a very strong response with almost 50% loss of live coral cover. And what's interesting as well is that from this data set, uh, it's been noted that in conjunction with the decline in live coral cover, there seems to be a shift away from planktivorous uh, palm-centric species and more towards fish that are benthic algal feeders. And this may have implications for the diet of these predators. So you can see this pattern uh, on this graph where we have a change in abundance prior to the, the last big plume and following it. And the same for sites. You can see while the while the size of the effect varies between sites, at all sites, Chromosomatida, which is characteristic of a plantivorous damsel in, in this region, is declining consistently across sites, and Chromosomatis water, which is a benthic algal feeder, is increasing on sites. So for this chapter, I'd like to exploit this uh, variability in the responses of reefs to drivers of degradation and also the changes in the response of the fish community to try and tease apart whether there is evidence for diet shifting in these predators. So the idea is that there are healthy reefs in the kettles and reefs that have become strongly degraded. Sorry, healthy is probably a strong term. Relative reefs with relatively higher coral cover. So on the reefs with higher coral cover, schools of, of planktivorous dental such as Chromis latida seem to dominate the prey community. Whereas on reefs that have become dominated by algae, more benthic territorial species such as Palmacetris water have begun to dominate. So these two systems have very distinct carbon signatures in their isotopic signal. So fish that are feeding on the plankton and sourcing their carbon from the plankton will have a very different signature in their tissue compared to fish that are feeding on benthic carbon. They will have, they'll carry this benthic carbon signature in their tissue. So by using external isotope analysis, I hope to look at the tissues of, of coral trout and see whether there's any evidence for a shift in carbon signal that may serve as evidence for the diet shift in these species. So if we look at this in isotopic space, on the x-axis we have delta-13 carbon, and then on the y-axis, delta-15 nitrogen. And the carbon axis tells us a little bit about where, where individuals are sourcing their carbon from, so where is that coming into the system. And then on the y-axis, the trophic position is um, dictated by the delta-15 nitrogen signal. So on one end of the carbon axis, you likely to have a signature that's more characteristic of a planktivorous, of a planktivore, so it's a plankton carbon signal, and on the other end, something more characteristic of a benthic signal. So for example, the species like Chromostatida, the planktivore, would have a, a signal characteristic of a plankton, planktivorous carbon, but feeding at a fairly low traffic level. Similarly, Promocentris wardi would sit more towards the benthic carbon signal and also the low trophic level. So predators that are feeding on planktivorous species will have a much higher trophic level, but still carry that characteristic carbon source from the base of the food chain. And you'll see a similar thing in, in predators that are feeding on a benthic source. So if there is a shift in the diets of these predators in the kettles, we would expect to see that as the prey community shifts with declining coral cover from planktivorous species to benthic species, we would expect to see a shift in the isotopic signal of the reef predators that are feeding on these species. So the methodology behind this. Um, the study species involved is a mesh of the coral trout, Plectrophomus, and the other great thing with this chapter is that there's actually um, a large archive of, of coral trout tissue that comes from the, the genetic study that's just been completed in the kettles. And these samples date back as far as uh, 2007 for some of them. So I've been able to use these tissues to look for 
uh, age shifts in the carbon signature between, between weeks and over time. Then in order to character, characterize what the carbon signal is for the two different types of prey species, I collected five chromocentrus wardai and five chromocentida from all sides, and um, then analyzed those, I sent those clock satellites to the analysis. Also collected a number of supporting samples. So two of those are the turf algae and the filter invertebrate. And this is just to further characterize exactly what the carbon signature is at the base of the food chain. Also, in doing one of the field trips down there, I noticed that Parmacentris malacensis and Parmacentris australis also seem to be fairly dominant in the potential prey community. So I've collected samples of these as well to help um, inform us about what any dietary shifts that may be occurring in these predators. So in the laboratory, I extracted clean tissue from all of these specimens and dried in a freeze, freeze dryer. And then those have all been packaged up and 159 samples sent off to Canada to the GLA lab at the University of Windsor, Windsor. And hopefully we should have some results back from that fairly soon. And those I'll analyze with the Bayesian isotope mixing model to see if there's any evidence for prey switching these predators with a relative, with a change in the relative contribution of the different carbon sources to their diets. This brings us to the third chapter. So the question for this chapter is how does trophic structure change with reef condition? And what are the implications for the trophic role of these reef meter predators? So the trophic structure of ecosystems has traditionally been represented using trophic pyramids. And these may be pyramids of energy, of biomass, or of numbers in the ecosystem. And then recently, we've seen an increasing shift towards representing trophic structure using size spectra. And uh, a size, in size spectra, we look at the individual organism's size. So an individual's body size is the key aspect here. And then on the y-axis, we can have either the organism's abundance or the abundance of a particular body size, or the biomass of a particular body size. So in using the organism's size, this method or this representation implicitly incorporates metabolic and science-based theory which is particularly appropriate for marine ecosystems, where many species actually have indeterminate growth, and there are very often oxygenetic diet shifts um, associated with these species. So in a publication by Trevilco et al. this year, they provide um, a very clear quantitative methodology for explicitly linking trophic pyramids to size spectra and for converting between the two. And in so doing, they provide a technique whereby we can use the, we can harness the very visually intuitive power of trophic pyramids, and, and then convert this to the mechanistic quantitative uh, representation of size spectra. So I plan to apply this method across um, sites that are both degrading and, and recovering, and have a look how trophic structure changes and what the implications are for predators. So we may expect on a, on a reef that is recovering that the pyramid may have a fairly robust shape with, um, with numerous trophic levels and a well-proportioned pyramid. And this would relate to a size spectra or something like this, where we have, we're likely to find the slope of negative one, which is characteristic of marine ecosystems. As reefs degrade, we may expect to see trophic simplification, where the, the number of trophic levels decreases. You may get a broadening of the base, as small fish proliferate, and important processes such as predation may start falling out. So this could highlight potential problems for predators in the community as their prey base changes and the dynamics of their evolution get affected. So a, a pyramid such as this may relate to a, a steepening of the size, size spectral slope. And this is driven by things like trophic energy, uh, the transfer efficiency of energy between trophic levels, and also the predator prey max ratio. So to test this method, um, field work we carried out at the same science as for chapter one. So just a reminder, this is Seychelles. Um, 21 sites around the inner island group, and we've got 12 reefs that are recovering, and then nine reefs that seem to have been move, moving into an algal phase shift where the reefs are dominated by microalgae. And the field work for this will, will entail the continuum with the, the long term monitoring program that's been going on in these reefs. So we'll quantify the benthic composition and topographic complexity of all reefs, and then using underwater visual sensors, quantify the fish community structure, looking at abundance, biomass, and body sizes of different taxa. The data from this will then analyzed using a size spectral analysis by hierarchical linear models to look for differences in the community structure between degrading reefs and recovering reefs. And this is done quantified using the midpoint height of the size spectra and this changes in slope in the size spectra. 
And then using triple code Alice methods, we can convert this to a traffic permit to harness that, that visually visual explanatory power to look and see are there life yet impacts or predators in these systems. Now my final chapter asks how do predictive changes in coral assemblages, assemblages moderate predator prey dynamics? And as you're all aware, rising um, ocean temperatures are resulting in a number of changes of coral reefs. And this, we, it's been predicted that we're likely to see a shift towards more thermally tolerant species. And associated with this shift, um, it's, we may also see a loss of structural complexity, as many of these, these more tolerant species have massive growth forms or encrusting growth forms that have limited um, niche space for fish. So this has been the focus of numerous recent studies. And this attention is, is, is well justified as it's likely to have broad reaching effects on, on the communities. And what I'm interested in is looking at how these impacts on the fish community are going to mediate impacts on, on the predator communities that feed on them. So to do this, we've set up a patch reef experiment um, at Lizard Island. We were up there last week, and we've constructed 16 patch reefs using two treatments. So on the first treatment, we populated the reefs with six different coral taxa that span the, the, the entire spectrum of thermal tolerance. So both species are extremely vulnerable, and those that are predicted to persist with increasing temperatures. The second treatment was um, population with tolerant species, so only those species that are likely are likely to have high levels of tolerance to increasing thermal stress. All reefs were measured to ensure that they were of standardized size. We quantified the structural complexity of all reefs, as well as the, the light coral cover on the reefs. So there are two phases to this experiment. Initially, I'll be monitoring the arrival of predators on these reefs uh, by means of periodic monitoring over the next 18 months to see how predators colonize these reefs as the fish community begins to establish. And this data will be analyzed using a longitudinal study. The second phase is a cage predator experiment, whereby five of each, so we've got eight, eight reefs in each of the, the two treatments. Five of those reefs, reefs in each treatment, will have um, a cage and, a predator, and predators introduced to them. And the predator that I intend to use is Pseudochromus fuscus. And this is a likely candidate because it's been used in numerous uh, cage experiments such as these. So I identify as a, a good candidate. The remaining three replicates within each treatment will be kept as controls, and on these reefs will case reefs and exclude all predators. Over the following six weeks um, after the introduction of the cages, I'll be monitoring um, predator strike rates and success using both video footage and direct observation, as well as prey survivorship within um, the reefs. And then finally, I'll look at predator growth rates. So this will be done by measuring the, the predators as they're introduced to the reefs, and then also when the experiment is terminated and measuring their final growth or their final size. Hierarchical linear models will be used to analyze this data, comparing the two different treatments and seeing if there are any differences in these predator prey relationships between the two, the two treatments of thermally tolerant versus more vulnerable species. So this brings me to uh, the final section where I'll give you an idea of what progress I've made to date. I'll give you a list of the sorts of publications I hope to produce from this thesis and then also give you a brief overview of the timeline and budget that I've uh, put together. So in terms of progress, um, I spent a fair bit of time in the field this year, which has been great. So I had two field trips to the Keppel Islands to collect the fish, algae, and invertebrate samples to, um, to analyze isotopes, and that was on trips in May and August, and this represents completion of, of all field work for this chapter. And then all those samples I've prepared in the, in the lab and freeze-dried, and they've all been sent off to the lab in Canada. <coughs> and hopefully we'll have results from those very soon. And then I've recently just returned as well from Fieldwork for Chapter 4, where we set up the 16 patch reefs at Desert Island. So this experiment is, is ready to run for the next 18 months, following which we'll introduce the cages. <coughs> That's an outline of my budget. It's <laughs> It's very detailed, so I'm afraid you're not supposed to read it there. If you would like to have a closer look at it, it is my research proposal. Um, in terms of funding, um, all my field trips and lab work in the astrophysics analysis thus far has been covered by the budgets of my various supervisors. And I also plan to apply for various funding, funding sources. 
as the opportunities are there. So the ATRS has two awards that I'll be, I'll be applying for. The Western Indian Ocean Marine Science Association also has a PhD grant that would be appropriate for my work in the Seychelles. The South African National Research Fund has a number of international scholars, scholarships for international PhD students. And I'll be applying for the JSU Graduate Research Scheme for funding for PhD students. And then I plan to, to publish at least a, a minimum of four publications from this thesis. Each one of these would relate to one of my, my research chapters. And this gives you the idea, an idea of the sorts of journals that I would be hoping to publish this work in. And then finally, my proposed timeline uh, looks something like this. So you can see in the first year, a large amount of my time has been spent in, in project planning. I've also spent a substantial amount of time in the field with three field trips. I've spent a substantial amount of time in the laboratory as well, preparing the sample size turbine analysis, and that is now complete. Um, I'm currently at the end of my confirmation candidate <coughs> process as well, and then the remainder of the year will be spent in data analysis and write-up. Then in year two, I plan to complete all of my field work, and in year three, the focus will be writing up and analysis of data. And if all goes to plan, then submission is planned for February 2016. So in closing, I'd just like to thank my amazing team of supervisors. They've really been exceptional with all their guidance and advice and support over the last few months. Um, I'm very lucky to have such a great team. And I'd also like to thank many of the people that have helped me in the field and in the lab with all their advice and expertise and just general support. I've mentioned a few here. There are numerous people that I have thanked. Many of you are here today. Um, thank you so much, and I really hope that I get to work with you all in the future. Thanks so much.